All right, friends, welcome to Armor Up Your Immune System, class number two. As I bring up the PowerPoint here, I want to welcome you back. If you missed class one, make sure you check out that in the link. Um, we'll get that over to you. That is a great intro to what we're um, going to continue with today, different topics today, but all in the theme of staying healthy and making sure you can do the best to support yourself and your family. So this, again, with the webinar or series that we're doing here, it can apply to you if you or your family struggle and find yourself constantly in this, excuse me, the cycle of getting sick, staying sick, just getting better, and then all of a sudden getting sick again. Or if you do pretty well during the winter and you want to just make sure you're staying on top of things and building that immunity to go nice and deep, and have nice, robust, long-lasting immunity for yourself and your family. So you can see by the sun coming in here today, we're uh, right at noon, and so you'll probably see some brightness and a little shadow as the sun is pouring in right now. Um, so let's recap. What we covered in class one is we talked about that just being around the bugs and the germs doesn't necessarily make you sick, and that more importantly, it's about how your body is that determines if you get sick or not. So just like with fruit flies, if the fruit's not rotten, you don't see fruit flies. If the fruit's overripe or rotten, that's when the fruit flies come into play. And we talked about the Deepak Chopra book where they talk, uh, they discuss a study by putting the cold virus up your nose that you only actually got sick 12% of the time with a cold, which I thought was pretty amazing. And we talked about um, chiropractic as one way to stay strong and robust um, gave the story of my grandma with polio and she had lost, lost the use of the left side of her body. And fortunately, she was able to get adjusted and restored that, was able to get through polio, which is pretty amazing. Um, but again, emphasizing that it was the importance of the strength of the body that determines how we do. And we talked about the good bacteria that are in our gut, in our lungs, the probiotics that you can get from fermented food. This is my son, Mason, and he is... Uh, just kind of getting through a sauerkraut kick where we'll put sauerkraut on the plate in front of him. And it doesn't matter how many other foods we put there. He always eats all his sauerkraut first and then eats the other foods. And he's just like starting to work through that now where he'll eat some of his sauerkraut and then start to eat his other foods. Um, and it's probably actually was a good sign that his gut needed some help and needed some good probiotics because of what uh, kids naturally crave and what they know is good for them. I remember when I was in Cairo school in nutrition class, he talked about a study where they took a bunch of little like toddler age kids, they tested them for different nutritional deficiencies, and then they put them in a room with a whole bunch of foods, and they found the kids actually naturally gravitated towards what food was going to fill that deficiency. So if they were low in vitamin A, they might go towards the sweet potatoes, or if they were low in vitamin C, they might go towards the oranges, uh, which I thought was pretty fascinating. So as uh, working with uh, giving my son foods that he craves, kind of listening to his body here and letting him lead the way. Anyway, so that was class one. Make sure you watch that if you haven't. Class two, today we're going to talk about what happens if you do get sick. Because even uh, no matter how robust we keep things, it's still we're still going to get sick once in a while. So we want to acknowledge that fact. I know other seminars that I've been to, mentors that I've had, they've said, you know, like, yeah, it's actually good to get sick once a year. Help your body detox and cleanse and get rid of things. Um, so that's going to be the focus today. And then next class is going to be specific to the winter months. How can you boost yourself during that time when it seems like people are getting sick more often? So to jump in for today, then let's say you are sick or your kiddo's sick, which I know can be tough to kind of heartbreaking once in a while, um, to see them struggling. And obviously it's uncomfortable, right? We might be coughing, sneezing, throwing up, having diarrhea. Uh, we got the chills, the sweats, the fevers, as that cycle rolls around in the body. So as we set the stage for today, I want you to look at those different things and actually ask yourself a question. If those things are happening, are you healthy or are you sick? And it might kind of come across as a trick question here, but let's take the example of eating some spoiled food that could give you food poisoning. You put that in your body and you start throwing up, right? So if are you throwing up in that moment, does that mean you're healthy or you're sick? Well, it might actually mean that your body's doing what it's supposed to do. 
So if we look at this a different way, let's pretend, and hopefully it never happens, but let's just say you're in a building and the building's on fire. That fire causes a smoke detector to go off. The smoke detector might be really, really annoying. Right? Just like all those symptoms we have when we're sick, they're really, really annoying. They don't feel good. They're not comfortable. But what are they there to do? Right? In the case of the smoke detector, it's there to tell you, one, that there's a fire. You should do something about it. And the other big emphasis when looking at this is the smoke detector is really annoying. But is that the cause of the problem? No, right? It's annoying to listen to, but the smoke detector is simply telling you there's a problem somewhere else. It's not actually the cause of the problem. And it's a good thing that the smoke detector is going off. So when we look at then symptoms in our body, if it is coughing, sneezing, throwing up, vomiting, diarrhea, what are those doing? Well, those are actually symptoms that are helping us do a normal response. We're going to talk about this more today. But it's looking at um, if your body is needing help getting rid of something and it can't quite do it in a real balanced way that you don't even know. Um, as we mentioned before, you might um, be around bugs and your immune system might kind of take it, get, uh, get rid of it under the surface and you don't even realize it because you don't come down with symptoms. Um, just like with COVID or um, the flu or the cold, all these other things, we might be exposed to them, but it doesn't mean we get symptoms. In the case where we don't get symptoms, it means that our body is able to take care of it in a good, balanced way. So let's say your body does need that extra support and it does need some more intense symptoms. The key to really understand here is that the symptoms are actually the solution. They're not the problem. If I eat spoiled food and I'm throwing up, the symptom is the solution to getting that spoiled food out of my body. So that's what we're going to go through today is if you have a cough, if you have a fever, understanding that those things are not the problem that we want to make go away, but they're actually your body getting rid of things that it doesn't need. They're the solution to the problem. And actually, um, jumping back here, so Dr. Larry Polevsky is a pediatrician out east, New York area, and I'm going to be mentioning some of his things today. And I, I would say, you know, to credit this actual quote, it would be coming from him. Um, and then the theme of what we're going to go over today is not only with him, but other um, uh, people that I've learned from obviously over the years and things that have applied to my own life. This is something the, um, the immune system is something that I really enjoy learning about. Uh, just a month ago, did a 12 hour continuing ad on neuroimmunology. So like something we're like, oh, if I could sit down and learn 12 hours about the immune system, I'm going to take advantage of that. Anyway, so I'm going to give an example here of what do I mean by the symptoms aren't the problem. They're actually the solution to the problem. So if we jump back over 100 years ago now, the Spanish flu, 1917, 1918, when that was going through the U.S., what happened here? So we're going to look at the state of Iowa had those under medical care for the flu had about 1 in 15 death rate. Those under chiropractic, 1 in 789. So way different here. Only 1 in 789 died when they're under chiropractic care. If we look in New York City during this time period, those using the traditional medical model, about 950 deaths out of 10,000. And those using a drugless model, only 25 deaths out of 10,000. If we look to pneumonia, here that gap is huge. 6,400 out of 10,000 died when they were using the medical route, and only 100 out of 10,000 when they used the drugless method. So as I go through this as an example, it's not to say like you never use medicine, but I'm going to emphasize the difference here of why these numbers um, in this report, why there is such a big gap, and then how you can apply this to yourself and your family. Um, if we jump to Oklahoma here, they during this time they had 233 cases where medical doctors had like given up the patients as loss. So they funneled them over to the chiropractor and said, hey, I think they're going to die anyway, see what you can do. And almost 90% were, were able to live um, under chiro care. And then nationally, they found that the chiros had a loss of only 1 out of 886. So with all those numbers, the emphasis here is the gap, right? Those using the medical model, um, a lot more died 
than those using either a drug list or the chiropractic model. So why is that? Well, obviously, if you're using the chiropractic model, you're getting adjusted, which we know is um, just something that really supports the immune system. We see it over and over with the families in our office when they're getting adjusted. They say either they don't get sick as often. When they do get sick, they clear things out more quickly. And I shared some of those stories during class one, too. Um, the other thing that was in common was when those using the non-medical model avoided two different prescriptions or two different medications. What the study found is that those using the medical model used cough suppressants and fever reducers. And aside from the boost from the adjustments, the drugless model, because it was a drugless, didn't use cough suppressants or fever reducers. And that was one of the conclusions that they found during this time period of those that were able to survive is they allowed the body to express itself they allowed the fever to run its course. They allowed the cough to like be productive and keep working rather than suppressing those things with different medications. And that's what I want to emphasize then today as we go through is how can you then support the body to express itself fully, which is going to allow you to get over things more quickly and then actually strengthen your body because you're going to be able to teach your immune system how to do things normally to get through things more quickly. And this is a different perspective than going to your medical doctor and that you might wonder like why haven't i heard of these things and um the things that i'm going to reference today i'm also going to reference the medical side of things from pediatricians from um children's hospital things like that where it's it's maybe not as common but it is known in the medical world and give you permission to actually do these things for yourself and your family and i think the challenge is that when a lot of patients go to the typical doctor, they say, hey, I'm dealing with this. What can you do to make me feel better? What can you do to make it go away, right? And not necessarily asking like, okay, well, if I'm dealing with this symptom, this fever, let's say, why is my body doing it? What can I do to support my body to actually become healthier from it? And that's what we're gonna look at today. So in order to support the body, we want to know what is the normal immune response, what's a healthy immune response. And then in the moment, if you are sick and you do, are experiencing the different symptoms that come up with that, what can you do to get over those things more quickly? And as I said, become stronger from, from that illness in the future. The link here uh, for some of these things you can reference if you go to Dr. Larry's website, northportwellnesscenter.com. I think you click his name and then he has a tab across the top that says if your child is sick. So some of what I'm talking about is from that. Some of it is from other resources, pulling them all together. But that's definitely something you want to have in hand for your family at home and be able to uh, kind of reference in the moment. So let's look at here the cycle of a normal healthy immune response. What happens is we have a bug. The prodromal period means we've been exposed to it and it's kind of brewing in our body. After it's brewed a little bit, our body says, whoa, we got to get rid of that thing. So let's start a fever. So we get some chills that um, we've raised our thermostat from, let's say our normal's 98.8. And now we raise our thermostat to 102. Our body's like, whoa, if I'm here and I should be there, I feel cold. So I'm going to start to shiver and get those muscles going to bring my temp up to that new thermostat of a fever level. The fever then activates a lot in the immune system. We'll talk about here in a few minutes. Um, get some antibodies going to do some fighting in the moment, but then also create some longer term immunity. And then all this, it's kind of like on a, a picture of the battlefields when they had the trenches on the sides and like the trench warfare. And there's all this rubble in between of people, you know, under battle and you get all the rubbish and now your body has to clear it out so that then we hit this stage of things oftentimes coming out through the skin, that's eruptions or the discharge. Um, and then lastly, if we've succeeded, we get to the other side of things in a healthy way. So we're gonna talk about, as I said, individual symptoms. And then before we do that, the general theme of how you can support your immune system in the moment. 
The key to remember here is that the immune system takes a lot of energy. And some of the things I'll share here, I know you've heard before, so I want to give you the context as to why they're important. So our body has a budget, just like you have a budget to run your month. You Maybe you have a car payment, maybe you have a mortgage payment, you have food, um, you've got utilities, and you've got going out for fun, right? And so you have a set budget. Let's pretend your budget, and this is just a case of an example, is $1,000, and you're spending $100 on your car every month. Well, if you spend 100 here, that means you have 900 free. All of a sudden, let's say you upgrade your car, and your car payment goes up to 600 a month. Suddenly, you're using all this budget, and you have only a little bit to run everything else in your house. The same thing happens when it comes to our immune system is if it's not fighting off a bug actively, it takes up a smaller part of the overall amount of energy our body has. If we're actively sick, suddenly the immune system is taking up 600 units instead of 100, and it's spending a lot more of our body's budget. So different tips that you've heard, why they work is that if our body is still working really hard on and trying to do everything else in life, it can't do that and give all that energy to the immune system at the same time. So if we can free up some energy for the immune system, it can get over things more quickly. So for example, digestion is a chunk that can use a lot of energy depending on what you're eating. When you're sick, you want to be able to make your digestion work more easily, so you want to eat simple foods, warm foods. Um, for liquids, you want like bone broth, hot tea, lemon water. Even avoiding something like juice when you're sick because the extra sugar and juice can be more inflammatory for the body. And if you're eating something more inflammatory, now the body has to spend energy dampening that. And again, it pulls from the immune system budget. One of the keys here, and again, it's going off of probably what you naturally crave. But if you're eating vegetables that might be really healthy, like carrot sticks, let's say, if they're cold and raw, your digestion has to spend a lot more energy on this. As a result, if you can have them cooked or steamed and uh, uh, broken down, they're a lot easier to digest. You save energy on digestion, you give it to that immune system budget. The other thing the brain sense spends a lot of energy on is sensory input and dampening it. So what I mean by this is if you're in, let's say you're at a party and there's music playing and there's lots of people talking all around you, you can still carry on the conversation with the person in front of you. This is because your brain spends a ton of energy in inhibiting all that other input into the brain. Inhibiting sensory input is also something the brain can have a really big budget to spend a lot of energy on. This is why you want to naturally limit lights, sounds. Um, you don't want to have a lot of like screen time because that is highly stimulating for the sensory system. Just doing less, slowing down transitioning going from place to place event to event spends can spend a lot of energy for the brain so limiting all those things helps free up resources in the brain if you're worried and your brain's kicking in fight or flight that uses up a lot of energy so slowing down taking away responsibilities knowing that if you're sick and you've got to put some projects on hold they're still going to be there for you when you get back and knowing that if you can really consolidate your energy in the early phase of getting sick and give your immune system a lot of energy to work with right away. It's kind of like, again, if we go to the battlefield and you wait till your army is like almost overrun, then try to send in extra troops, it's going to be a lot harder to kick out the defenders. But as soon as the defenders start coming, you send a bunch of extra troops in right away. Now your body has all this energy to kick those defenders out or those bad guys out earlier. And sleep is something that we know is good for us. And I just really, really want to emphasis, emphasize this because I know for myself, anytime I feel like a little bit coming on, if I get to bed early, I boom, like almost by the next day, pretty much every time I feel like I kick it out. Again, because I'm freeing up energy, allowing my immune system to get all those bad guys in or all the, the support in right away to kick those bad guys out. So that's the general theme. Free up energy, do less, rest. For specific symptoms then, now let's go into <clears throat> what we can do to support your body in all the little things it's doing. Remembering that your immune system 
your nervous system, your innate intelligence in your body that you're born with is incredibly intelligent. So it's going to do things only if it deems them necessary, and it's going to do them very specifically for what it has going on in the body. So if we look at something like a cough, as we mentioned in the Spanish flu example, when they suppressed the cough, people did worse in their outcome, even though maybe they felt better, they still had more, more likely to die. So while it's uncomfortable, if we can support the body, you're going to get stronger from it and get through things more quickly. So if we look at a cough, what is it doing here? Well, oftentimes right away, it's trying to get some irritants out. So it might be dry to start. As it's accumulated things to push out of the body, now we start getting that productive cough. The mucus starts to come. If you have mucus coming, we know it's a good sign that your body's moving things along. And we don't want to dry that mucus up. We don't want to like hold it back. If you've ever been in a public place and like you kind of cough and you get that phlegm come up in your throat and you're looking around, maybe you're in the middle of a meeting and you're like, oh crap, I can't really like go to the trash can and spit this out right now. And you've got to swallow it back down how like disgusting that is. Well, it's because your body just spent a lot of energy getting things into its in your mucus to push it out of the body. It doesn't want it to go back in. So if you can thin the mus mucus instead of drying it up, it allows it to come out of the body. Hydration helps thin, going into a steam, maybe using some essential oils like eucalyptus or peppermint, something that opens up the passages, the airways, get the breath flowing through and that steam to hydrate because now you're going to help that mucus do its job, which are two things. The mucus helps if something does come in, try to catch it right away and push it out. And then two, if there are a bunch of waste products built up, as I mentioned, it's helping push them out and move them out of the body. That's why um, we have our digestive tract and our lungs, as we talked about in class one, are both lined with the good bacteria, the probiotics, as a big part of our immune system. So if we have something that it's pushing out and it's moving up, and then it's trying to get it out. Um, <clears throat> if you ever, uh, so for example, if you're sick, dairy might not be the best for some people because for some people, when they eat dairy, it actually like thickens that mucus and some people have a little bit of a reaction to it. This is if you've ever eaten something and afterwards you're like, <clears throat> I'm always you're clearing your throat, let's say. It's because there was some sort of inflammatory piece to that, some sort of irritant that the body didn't like. And in that case, it's pushing it to the surface, trying to get it out with the mucus. And if you're eating that same thing, then when you're sick, now your body's saying, oh, like I've got to spend energy getting the bug out and I've got to spend energy getting out this thing my body doesn't like. And it's stealing from the resource, the budget for the immune system. Um, helping drain with the neti pot, doing massage along the chest here. Essential oils can be really nice too. Massaging up and down the spine can help getting get things going. If you have, if you feel like there's some swelling here, um, massaging down the neck, and we'll actually kind of jumping ahead here sometimes with sore throats, you want to get things moving through the lymph nodes, the tonsils, and the other lymph nodes in the, the neck and the throat. So you always want to massage, in that case, down toward the heart to get that fluid moving because your body's trying to kill things off and push them out. And if they get stagnant, they sit there longer. And if you can move it, the lymph always, you want to get it towards the heart. So massaging anything that's um, sore or swollen, massage it toward the heart, get that fluid moving toward the heart. One thing for coughs too, if you're worried like, hey, is my kid getting enough oxygen or myself? Um, you can get a little thing that goes on your finger called a pulse oximeter that measures your how much oxygen is in your blood. And there's the link there that the FDA has out of how to use this without... Uh, making sure you're not like getting in trouble by ignoring something you should be going seeing a doctor around. Uh, but it's something that you can get off Amazon pretty inexpensively. You don't need anything too fancy and you just want to monitor. Normally that number should be 95 or above. And if you have your own baseline for yourself or your kiddo and all of a sudden you see that number dropping, that might be a concern saying, hey, this cough might be getting a little too deep and um, stealing some oxygen from the body. 
other things to acknowledge um, just going back here one sore throats as I mentioned we want to get things draining moving toward the heart simple things like gargling salt water obviously effective the one thing I want to mention with sore throats is that if you find yourself or your child getting a lot of these that's also a really good thing to bring up with your chiropractor if certain things are off in the neck they can cause a lot of swelling and congestion in the neck in the tonsils adenoids area and lead to more inflammation there which then if you are getting sick and getting like say strep throat a lot you find that all oh, that congestion is building up here it gets really uncomfortable if that congestion builds up so sometimes with chiropractic if we open up the drainage there it helps it move through and you can get through things more quickly uh, sleep we talked about honoring your body resources there and making sure it's getting enough knowing that if your kids are extra grumpy or your spouse for that matter um, the brain again spends a lot of energy like inhibiting and holding things back if we're sick suddenly that immune system is using up more energy and our brain doesn't have as much energy to like make us think as clearly before we act so just giving some um, grace I guess to our loved ones all right last symptom here we're gonna go over and then we'll wrap up for this class is the one we're going to spend the most time on because fevers are obviously I'd say where I find parents get most concerned especially when it comes to their kiddo and at the same time fevers can be one of the most beneficial things to let run their course so going back to that cycle of an immune of a healthy normal immune response fever is right in the middle of that so the body is doing a fever for a reason it's not just randomly saying I'm gonna spend some energy boosting your temperature today and making you not feel good the body very deliberately chooses to do a fever. A fever helps activate the immune system. One is it helps increase the amount of white blood cells being produced and then increases how quickly they move from point A to point B to get to where the bad guys are. It actually helps them make some chemicals kind of like little hooks that attach to the outside of the white blood cells so they can jump in to the lymph nodes and help kill things off. One thing too is a fever doesn't mean infection for example with a kiddo with a fever it might just be that they're teething the body does a very good job at picking a specific temperature it's going to be able to recognize is that a bacteria or is that a virus what kind is it and a lot of bacteria and virus the reason they invade a human body is that they thrive at the temperature a human's body a normal range is in that you know 98.6 plus or minus as a result, if we can boost that temperature, suddenly that germ that invaded us can't replicate as well. And that's one of the reasons the body is smart enough to choose a fever is to slow down how quick that germ can multiply or divide. Amazingly enough, a fever will help pull out certain minerals out of our bloodstream, like um, iron is an example, copper is an example, that germs tend to use to multiply and divide, slowing them down again. If you let them run their course, they tend to be more intense, but you also get through them more quickly. And we're going to talk about that next is how intense can you let them get? This was a study that found that kids who had fevers early in life were actually less likely to develop allergies and asthma later in life. And they even showed that if it were just like real low grade fevers, it had less of an effect. But if as the fever got higher, that they're even less likely to have allergies or asthma later in life because of how it activates the immune system. And we might talk about that more in class three of a balance in the immune system between something called Th1 and Th2. But ultimately, when your child is allowed to run a fever, it gets the immune system in a more balanced state to set it up for success in the future. So this is a handout then we're gonna go through, all right, so if you want me to let my child's fever run its course, what if it gets so high? What if they're really uncomfortable? I don't know how high I want to let it go. So this is something taken from the medical doctor, Dr. Schmidt, as you see there, professor of pediatrics at University of Colorado School of Medicine. He's a medical director at the Children's Hospital in Colorado. Also pulled, you can go to the Seattle Children's Hospital website and do fever myths versus facts in their search bar and you'll get these same things so that's where these uh, myths and facts are coming from 
So number one, the biggest thing that parents have a concern about, and rightfully so, is isn't it dangerous to let my child run a fever? Here's the thing. What they have found, and it's, I know it could be tough to like even think about this, but they said it actually like takes a fever of 108 to cause brain damage. They've also found that the body is going to usually cap out at like 105, 106. I had read um, a pediatrician's blog post once where she's like, yeah, my nine month daughter, her first fever she had was 105.6. And it was a temporal um, read. So it might've been a little bit lower than that, but she's like, it was kind of nerve wracking, but I let her run its course for a few hours. I didn't do any fever lowers. And sure enough, a few hours later, suddenly she's crawling around almost like back to herself. What the concern is that like, is this fever going to cause brain damage? And really, they haven't found that. The only time that a fever is going to spike up to something like 108 is not if the body's making it go that high, but if they're in some sort of outside environment, like a really hot car, let's say, in that closed environment, that's the only chance it's going to really get that high. Um, there's an article there from the New York Times you can read that talks about this. And then... Um, we're going to jump into then, well, what if it gets hot enough and my child gets a seizure? So here again, that's obviously like we don't want to watch our kiddo have a seizure, like not promoting that. Um, but I want to like calm some of the worry around it is that they found that like it here again in that moment, it's not like brain damage that's happening that's causing the seizure. Years ago in the journal of pediatrics, I had read a study I think this was in the mid 80s where a bunch of pediatricians had gotten together and said okay like, what's causing a febrile seizure and what they found is that it wasn't the temperature that got warm enough that caused a seizure it was actually because the immune system uses a fair amount of calcium and if it's been fighting things for a while and depleting calcium the muscles go into a state of seizure and that was the correlation they had of where the febrile seizure was coming from or it can come from so um and actually it looks like that got put in there twice but university of rochester medical center the other interesting thing is they said like we actually haven't found any evidence either that if you do treat a fever you're actually going to reduce the risk of having a seizure number three we know that the brain as i said before it's it has a cap it's trying to pick the right temperature for the body in that moment to fight things off. So it's not going to, if you don't treat it, it's not going to keep going higher, higher, higher. And I remember the first time my son had like a really intense fever where like you could be this far away, right? And you feel the heat like pouring off. And I was going to, you know, doing his temp. I'm like, it's got to be like 110 in there. It's, it's so, so hot. It just feels um, intense. And it was, you know, a lot smaller than 110 obviously but the point was it wasn't like going to keep going 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 is his body was going to cap it off um with treatment then the other thing is it just because you give something to lower the fever it doesn't mean that all of a sudden it goes back down to normal what they found is that like it, it lowers the fever a little bit but it also will extend the duration of how long your child is sick Um, here, you probably know this, that there's a normal range. Not only is 98.6 just the average, it's not like normal that everyone is at. Everyone has a different baseline. But also throughout the day, our uh, temperature ebbs and flows. So if you're in the late afternoon or the evening, you probably have a little bit natural higher temperature already. And then the last piece to emphasize is it can be easy to get caught up on the number and if you see the number going higher and higher to become more worried as in, well, if it's all the way up to 104, this must mean my child or myself is more sick than usual. And here, again, that is not the case at all. It's actually simply, again, what the body needs to fight off whatever germ it's fighting off and where it's at in that process. So just because you're getting a high fever doesn't mean it's a more serious illness. All right, so then what can you do to support the fever? And actually, before I jump to that one, we've got a couple minutes here, and then we'll be done with class two. 
make sure you do get your child adjusted. What we'll see a lot of times with kiddos, if they're like working on fighting something out, they might come into the office and they've had the low grade fever for a bit. We'll adjust them. All of a sudden that fever will spike like it's supposed to, but then boom, it comes back down and the body clears things out a lot more quickly. Other things, make sure you're keeping your child warm. If you give them a warm bath, they get a little sweat, helps cool their body and keep that cycle going. Um, a lot of this too is on Dr. Larry's website on what to do if your child's sick. So we'll go through these pretty quick, but you can use some essential oil. There's this wet sock treatment that a naturopath taught him about that he said his patients really love. So you can read about that there. Um, if you're worried and wondering like, hey, is my kid getting enough fluids? Make sure you keep an eye on their year and it's a good way to tell. Um, you've probably experienced yourself if you're on a hot summer day and you haven't drank much and by the end of the day, like your urine's changing to that dark yellow color, it's because you're dehydrated. So it's an easy way to keep an eye on your kiddos scenario. Here too is because I'm not a medical professional in the realm of pediatricians, um, want to make sure like you don't hear me telling you like, oh, so you just never ever go to the doctor if your child has a fever. No, that's not it at all. You check in with them, right? If, if, if it feels like they're doing okay, if they're alert, if they're kind of active, if they're drinking fluids, if they're, you know, able to kind of like stay with it, not like cloudy or disconnected that means they're managing it okay. So here's some things that if your child's not doing these things, you definitely want to go um, to urgent care or seek out your family doctor right away. And same here, I'm not gonna read all these because it's something you can do on your own. So take a screenshot if you need, but again, a few things to look out for. All right, so then the last piece here, we've gone through fever. The last piece is your body has to get rid of it with the eruptions or discharge. So you may experience a rash afterwards. Here again, this is part of the normal process. The good news with a rash, as you saw in that chart there, it means the body's almost done. It's like done all this battle. It's, it's waged war, it's had, the battlefield's been um, pounded on, and it's really completing the process. So if you're getting a rash, like say with chicken pox, and they're bubbling up, moving out, it's because your body's almost done with things. A lot of times if your body is clearing out all these uh, germs or its own cells that it had to kill off in the process. That's part of what's pushing out. Um, that's like the pus as an example is all the immune cells did battle in an area and now they're pushing it out. So if the liver's not able to cleanse on the inside, the skin can push it out on the outside. If you again let the body push it out all the way, it's helping that immune cycle complete the process. Taking something like a steroid cream might make you feel better in the moment and it might decrease that inflammation, but now you're taking like this last piece the immune system's trying to do and pushing it back in instead of letting it express and go back out. And of course, no judgment, because I remember as a kid, you know, I did a lot of, or I took things like Tylenol or fever suppressants, or if I've had a rash as a kid, I would have mom or dad, you know, put these things on me. So there's not like judgment if you've done these for yourself or your family, I just want to empower you to understand that if you let the body express itself all the way, it's going to get through things more thoroughly, more completely, and be healthier on the other end. So something that you can really do going forward. So as we wrap up here then, the question to ask is instead of like, hey doc, how can you help me feel better? Ask the question, what is my body trying to do and how can I support it? Because if I let my body express itself, my body is incredibly intelligent and it's going to know what it needs to do to figure things out. And that's going to allow you to get healthier on the other side. I took this picture two nights ago. This is our medicine cabinet, we'll say, in our bathroom, um, just to show you like on the inside of what our household looks like. We've got some deodorant, we've got some, I got some sea salt hairspray I use for my hair, like some oils, some skin creams, we've got our neti pot in there. But the point with that cabinet is it's not filled with suppressants. Like in our household, we actually don't have Tylenol, we don't have ibuprofen, Aleve, Advil, we don't have anything like that. Simply because over the years that I've learned to trust the body, I've been able to live out these things that I'm teaching you. And um, knowing that 
whenever I take something, it's to help my body express itself rather than suppress it and push it back down. All right, so as we wrap up for today, then expressing instead of suppressing, I think you've heard me say it a bunch, but that's the theme. Next class, we're gonna go over now specifically during the winter months, why do we get sick more often and what can we do about it to boost ourselves during that time to make sure you're healthy for the holiday season, get healthy into the new year, and get off on a good foot, especially that January, February season where sometimes we can kind of get run down um, just to make sure your body can stay strong throughout the winter. So reach out if you have any questions, if you need any help, if you need any resources, and I will see you guys in class three.